My name is Sister Margaret Palliser, and tonight we are here for the third Dr. J.T. Vincent Liu Lecture. The Dr. Liu Lectures are possible because of a generous gift from his family that enables us to offer educational opportunities on topics of Catholic social teaching here at Dominican Convent in Spark Hill. Dr. Liu shared the Dominican Sisters' deep commitment to social justice, and these lectures perpetuate Dr. Liu's legacy as a great humanitarian. And tonight it is my pleasure to introduce our distinguished guest speaker, His Eminence Cardinal Joseph Tobin of Newark. A leader, a pastor, a scholar, a brother. Cardinal Tobin is one of the most insightful, courageous, and appreciated voices of our church here in the United States. A native of Detroit, Joe Tobin was the eldest of 13 children which certainly helped to prepare him for living in community <laughs> when he found his true spiritual home when he joined the Congregation of the Most Holy Redeemer, better known as the Redemptorists. His journey with the Redemptorists brought him to Mount St. Alphonsus Seminary in Esopus, New York for his graduate studies in theology. The Spark Hill Dominican Sisters claim a special connection with Cardinal Tobin. Before his ordination in 1978, he was assigned as a seminarian to teach religious education classes at St. Christopher Parish in Red Hook, New York, where he worked with our sisters for two years. We feel very blessed by the friendship he has maintained with them over these many years. Father Tobin's gifts were soon recognized by his Redemptorist brothers, who called him to serve in many positions of leadership, including as Superior General of the Redemptorists in Rome from 1997 to 2009. In 2010, he was ordained to the Episcopate and named Archbishop Secretary of the Congregation of Institutes for Consecrated Life and Societies of Apostolic Life. Now, that's a long title. <laughs> where he graciously served men and women religious around the world until his appointment as Archbishop of Indianapolis in 2012. In 2016, he was appointed Archbishop of Newark and elevated to the College of Cardinals. In his current role as Chair of the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops Committee on Clergy, Consecrated Life and Vocations, Cardinal Tobin continues to provide guidance and support to men and women religious in the United States. As if his administrative and pastoral duties of Archbishop of Newark were not enough, Cardinal Tobin also serves as the president and chair of the Board of Trustees of Seton Hall University and as a member of the Board of Trustees of the Catholic University of America in Washington, D.C. This evening, following his presentation, Cardinal Tobin has graciously agreed, agreed to take a few questions. Cardinal Tobin, we are so grateful that you have taken time out of your very busy schedule to be with us tonight. Welcome. Thank you very much, uh, Sister Mary, Sister Margaret, for the, the welcome. And thank you for that applause. I think people that applaud before they hear somebody speak <laughs> are very kind. You're probably accustomed to speakers saying something like this, uh, I'm really happy to be here. I'm not going to say that. I'm going to say I'm really grateful to be here. Because some 40 years ago, sisters from here welcomed us into their life, uh, not simply as a religion teacher, but as a brother. Magically produced beer and pizza <laughs> <laughs> on a regular basis supported us, guided us, and this friendship has remained. Some of them have gone to heaven, and I was privileged to pray at their graves this afternoon. But uh, some of them are still here, like Sister Margaret, uh, Patricia McDermott. I hope you're watching, Sister Margaret. I, I hope I don't embarrass the home team. <laughs> I'd like to tell you what I don't want to do. That comes from a... Uh, a link that I have for 30 years, a time when I used to work honestly in the church. I was, I was a pastor on the north side of Chicago 
not too far from Wrigley Field. And the people still send me emails and notes and let me know who won the turkey at the raffle and who got married and who got buried. And uh, last spring, I got a, received an email from a young dad who I think was an altar boy when I was the pastor. His name is Tom, and he was, he was talking about walking home from church one Sunday with his little son, Sam. Sam was seven years old at the time, and he was getting ready to make his first communion. So he's paying attention to everything that went on in church. And Tom says, he, that morning he was trying to figure out what Father was talking about. Imagine that. And he turned to Sam on the sidewalk, and he said, hey, Sam, who do you think Father was talking to? Was he talking to the little kids, or was he talking to the grown-ups? So Sam thought that over. Then he looked up and he smiled and he said, I think he was talking to himself. <laughs> and I think, I believe that's an occupational hazard, not just for priests, but also for bishops. I don't want to talk to myself. What I hope to do is engage with you in a little reflection on one of the great challenges that we have as a nation and as a church. Not too long ago, at a dinner party, uh, I was sitting, sitting next to a lady, and I guess she didn't know quite what to ask me. Uh, so she said, um, what do you think is the most important issue the church faces today? I didn't hesitate. I said, the breach between faith and life. She said, I, I wasn't expecting that. I said, no, you wanted me to probably talk about a hot-button issue. Uh, actually, I believe that's the, the big issue, the overarching issue we're going to talk about. And it has to bear with something that last year at the bishops' meeting I talked about, a church that's suffering in a country, perhaps, that's suffering from a heart condition, cardiosclerosis, the hardening of the heart. But I don't want to simply stay with that. I'd like to talk about how we re reawaken the heart. You know, how we realize, with God's help, that prophecy of Ezekiel. I'll take the stone out of your chest and replace it with a human heart, a fleshy heart. Let me tell you a story from those years in Rome. I was sent over there in 1991. And one of the first assignments I had was in 92, 93 to visit uh, the redemptorists who live in the country of Chile. And Chile, as you know, is a, a mountainous country, long country, uh, going through its own struggles right now with some of the same scandals we have here in the United States. But I arrived in, in the spring of 92, 93, 93 I guess it was, and I arrived just after my brothers had elected the leadership for the country. The leader, Sister Mary, was elected on the 35th ballot. He didn't receive any votes on the first 34. <laughs> so you don't have to be a rocket scientist to figure out this is one seriously divided group. So a couple of days later, and I'm in the garden behind our house in Santiago, I, I was walking with this fellow, Raul is his name, Father Raul, and I said, what was going on in the chapter? I mean, what happened? And he looked at me and he said, Jose, if you want to understand us, and you want to understand our situation, you have to understand that we lived under a military dictatorship from 1973 to about 1988, 89, so, so shortly before I arrived. And we hated it. We preached against it. We had prayers of the faithful against it. We demonstrated with the people, some of us went to jail, but without us being aware of it, we began to treat each other like the military. Their way of thinking penetrated us and we became juntas. That was a, an important moment for me because I later saw it validated in other cultural contexts, visiting communities in the former uh, Soviet Union or in Ukraine or in Belarus 
where they detested the Communist Party, but they learned a lot from the Communist Party. And now that the Communists officially were gone, they continued to treat each other with some of the things that they had learned. And so part, I think an important part of what I'd like to speak about is what have we learned uncritically? What have we brought into the church from the wider social ambient? How did we get to this point in our culture? Now that can be a difficult question to answer and I don't believe that in bite-sized morsels. It's complex. But let me try to frame it with another current event. It's no secret that after the last year, the events really that began last June, the Catholic Church in this country has been brought to its knees by the bitter fruits of a toxic culture of clerical uh, sexual abuse of minors and cover-up. And as Catholics, we look on aghast and ask, how was this allowed to happen? How did it get like this? Now this painful issue, which is evoking, I believe, globally a sea change in this country, and I am confident will eventually lead to healing and a restoration of trust. That's not what I'm gonna talk about tonight. <laughs> Instead, I'm going to address another issue that also impacts on millions of lives, destroys families, and has left countless numbers of children forever traumatized. I think of the people in my archdiocese who tell me with tears in their eyes, when I kiss my kids good morning, I'm not sure I'm going to be there to kiss them good night. And I've made out something like a will that if I disappear, the neighbors will care for them. I want to speak of, with you and reflect with you on the issue of immigration, particularly on immigration and the way we see it as a result of cardiosclerosis, of a hardening of the American heart. Now, as one who lived outside the United States for about 21 years, I had the experience on returning of, of having to learn a whole lot of stuff. I mean, I'm not sure I can recoup everything. I, I've never seen Seinfeld. And I hear people quote Seinfeld all the time, and I say, I don't know, I don't know. What's worse in New Jersey, I never saw The Sopranos. <laughs> That's a big cultural deficit. But I also don't remember when I left in November of 1991, the degree of polarization within the society, the clear demarcation between red and blue states. I was surprised by this, shocked. And I naively thought it was at a fever pitch when in 2012, I returned as the Archbishop of Indianapolis. An issue that has stood out to me in particular over the last three years or so, especially, has been the hardness, callousness, and cruelty that has come to characterize the attitudes even among Catholics towards immigrants. Now, I'm not going to begin a, free, uh, a talk that's based on things like, we are a nation of immigrants. We are, you all know that. Or. As Judeo-Christians, we are called to welcome the stranger. We are. Instead, I would like to see the profound reason that lies at the root of this cardiosclerosis and what it says about our priorities, the world around us, and how we perceive that world. First, our priorities. I mentioned polarization just a few moments ago, and I saw some people nodding their heads think we know what we're talking about. It's an apt, though rather worn perhaps, characterization of our politics. Worn and incomplete. Anti-immigrant sentiment is one but highly visible manifestation of the overall harsh, merciless edge we are so quickly to apply to our discourse. 
One can only think of what happened in New York when the governor signed a savage abortion bill and the fierce joy that was expressed and the lighting of the World Trade Center. However, harsh rhetoric and dishonest caricatures, which has produced the fruit of hardline immigration adopted by the present administration, it sadly feels like this fits. It's a natural outcome of a we win, you lose nature of our politics. And when kindness is so alien to the discourse to begin with, and we've reached a place with our politics where, we comprom where compromise is unthinkable, because everything is simply too important, something else is going on. There's a reason at the depths of this experience. And I believe a friend of mine who went home to God a couple of years ago, Francis Cardinal George, a, uh, an oblate of Mary Immaculate who has served as the, the first native Chicagoan to serve as Archbishop in his hometown, and also the president of the United States Council Conference of Catholic Bishops. In 2010, he reflected on the fight that was then surrounding the passage of the Affordable Care Act. And he said in his speech to the bishops, for too many, politics is the ultimate horizon of thinking and acting. For too many, Politics is the ultimate horizon for thinking and acting. Now what does that say about priorities? If you had told me that there was a commandment of, our whole, of the word of God that should speak to the hearts hardened against immigrants, I would have assumed that it was the one that said, love your neighbor as yourself. Instead, the words of Cardinal George direct us to the first commandment. I am the Lord your God. Have no strange gods before me. Cardinal George's analysis that politics is the ultimate horizon of too many people's thinking and acting speaks loudly of a problem, not with the first amendment, but with the first commandment. People are treating politics and policy agendas as their god, as their idol. And that's why compromise or anything less than zero sum, be that on immigration, abortion, entitlements, etc., is simply unconsciousable. And from a practical standpoint, I think it's worth noting that this river of our life in the States now is flowing in the wrong direction. That is, the teaching and values of our faith should inf inform our politics, not the other way around. Political means are there to serve the common good. The bishop's statement are the, the guide on, on voting, forming consciences for faithful citizenship at number 14, actually encourages individual Catholics to stick with their political party and work for change from the inside. Now, I think that means Catholic Democrats should generally stay Democrats, but work to loosen their party's death grip on abortion and see the horizon of human development and flourishing greater than simply a societally sanctioned sexual identity. This means that Catholic Republicans should generally stay Republicans, but allow the consciences of their party leaders and elected officials to be disturbed by our church's moral doctrine on the poor, health care, the rights of workers, care for the environment, and yes, the rights and dignity of immigrants. As for libert libertarians, well, I'm not sure I can help you there. <laughs> Now, when, when politics become your idol, there are at least three consequences that become possible, none of them good. First, as I just mentioned, people let their bad politics overtake their faith in terms of what holds the most sway with their conscience. We as Catholics have plenty of this. Secondly, people let these ideologies warp their actual proclamation of their faith. You might recall when the news of the separation of families at our southern border burst on the scene, 
there were Christian politicians who wanted to use the word of God to justify it, to justify splitting up families. And thirdly, people discarding faith altogether and leaving the political realm unchallenged. So that the people who are in protest and disillusion and whatever leave the religious realm just simply gives an unbridled power ever growing to the political forum that is bereft of a sense of the common good. As far as discarding faith is concerned, that third point, the third possible consequence, which I think is happening, there's nothing novel about a bishop or cardinal bemoaning secularization in our culture. I used to go crazy in, uh, I was a member of five synods of bishops, and it was predictable the first couple of weeks you'd hear speech after speech moaning about different isms, the secularism, uh, hedonism, individualism, all the, the parade of isms. However, I believe that we focus too little on how the secularizing influences changes our priorities and plays into an issue like immigration and people's attitudes towards immigrants. We try to explain, but first a little aside. I'd like to, to mention a, a, an article that I, I read a couple years ago, uh, 2017 in the Atlantic. It had a very interesting title. It was a, called Breaking Faith. The culture war over religious morality has faded. In its place is something much worse. What does that mean? Well, the article noted how drops in church attendance in the United States are coarsening the cultural wars and turning them more primal. Let me quote a little bit of what the author was talking about. He wrote, research shows that evangelicals who don't regularly attend church are less hostile to gay people than those who do. That's arguably a good thing. But they're more hostile to African Americans, Latinos, and Muslims. In 2008, the University of Iowa's Benjamin Noel noted that among Catholics, mainline Protestants, and born-again Protestants, the less you attended church, the more anti-immigration you were. And he posited this may be true in Europe as, as well. I think it quite is true. And the article included a priceless quote from a Professor Jeffrey Lehman of a small Catholic college in Northern Indiana called Notre Dame, <laughs> who noted, Trump does best among evangelicals with one key trait. They really don't go to church. So non-practice isn't neutral. It's not simply a, we shouldn't say, well, that's people's choice. Or simply the result is it can have a very deleterious effect on how people see the issues before us, like immigration. And of course, any talk of the Trump voter inevitably brings us to a discussion of what's happening in the world around us and what that's doing to people, how we see the world. For example, we could look at statistics about how wages have been essentially stagnant since the early 1970s. However, I would rather turn to a favorite source of wisdom, Pope Francis, for a little input. He said in a message of a couple of years ago, the economic system that has the god of money at its center and that sometimes acts with the brutality of robbers in the parable of the Good Samaritan inflicts injuries that to a criminal degree have remained neglected. Globalized society frequently looks the other way with the pretense of innocence. Under the guise of what is politically correct or ideologically fashionable, one looks at those who suffer without actually touching them like the priest and the Levite. But they're televised live. They're talked about in euphemisms and with apparent tolerance. But nothing is done systematically to heal the social wounds or to confront the structures that leave so many brothers and sisters by the wayside. This hypocritical attitude, so different from that of the Samaritan, manifests an absence of true commitment to humanity. Now, Pope Francis wrote that message for a meeting in the United States 
in Modesto, California in 2000, February 2017. It was a world meeting of popular movements. Francis is nobody's fool. As a son of the global south, he's seen the game played for too long for him to sugarcoat. He knows that scarcity begets scarcity and the people feel abandoned, who feel abandoned by their brothers and sisters soon join in on the action of this unraveling of solidarity. And here the Pope says there's a real danger. The system's gangrene, according to Francis, cannot be whitewashed forever because sooner or later the stench becomes too strong. And when it can no longer be denied, the same power that spawned this state of affairs sets about manipulating fear, insecurity, quarrels, and even people's justified indignation in order to shift the responsibility for all these ills onto whom? Onto the non-neighbor. There it is. Not no longer love your neighbor, fear your neighbor. We forget that structural and systematic injustices are not mere structures and that too often they're also bad actors who are all too willing to play off these structures and our fears for maximum personal gain. Fear, the Pope says elsewhere, weakens us, throws us off balance, breaks down our psychological and spiritual defenses, anesthetizes us to the sufferings of others, and in the end, makes us cruel. Again, in his message to that meeting in Modesto, California, he observed, Jesus teaches us a different path. Do not classify others in order to see who is a neighbor. Remember, the lawyer asks, who is my neighbor? Presumably, he was expecting that there are people who are not his neighbor. You can become a neighbor to whomever you meet in need and you will do so if you have the compassion in your heart. That is to say, if you have the capacity to suffer with someone else, you must become a Samaritan, says Francis. You see, the Samaritan sees the world differently. The injured man by the roadside is not seen as someone pot potentially dangerous or unclean, but as someone whose suffering he should share. We too are challenged to perceive our world differently, to not be blind to the profound upheaval and change around us, but at the same time, not to be threatened by it and throw up walls, whether physically or existentially. We're challenged to see the whole picture. And particularly, we're challenged to see people's faces. I recall as a young pastor in Detroit, the general government of my order asked to have a meeting, an international meeting in Detroit. And I received a letter from one of the people invited, a Brazilian redemptorist, saying, I don't want to come because all I'll find in Detroit are white imperialists. I said, why don't you come and have a look around? <laughs> so he came and for three days he said, where are the Americans? <laughs> I said, these are the Americans. He said, but they're not all white. I said, no. He said, they don't speak English, some of them. I said, no. They're very poor. I said, yes. He said, this is the third world. I said, maybe the fourth world or the fifth world. But the point was he had a caricature. He didn't see their faces. By the way, if I could just say it's really an advantage to be the Archbishop of Newark and being from my hometown. Because at least once a week someone says to me, Cardinal, you have to be careful where you walk in Newark. <laughs> now I say, well, I'll try not to be stupid, but I'm from Detroit. <laughs> <laughs> and that seems to pacify them. <laughs> a venerable Catholic publication, one I think most of us know, our Sunday visitor, asserted the importance of seeing in our response, of seeing in our response to the plight of immigrants. When the world reaches, they said in an article, high levels of global migration, we cannot lose sight of the factors, war, poverty, and other violence, that prompt a family to, to flee from everything they have 
and have ever known. When we see only people and not what they're fleeing from, we can stop seeing the people altogether. I remember my grandmother who came from a very prominent part of Europe called County Kerry. <laughs> when she was 17, she, uh, my dad and his brothers would put their money together and say, why don't you go home? Why don't you go back to Kerry and see your, your family? And she would answer them very brusquely, all I knew was poverty. You go back. So finally when she was 75, she went back and then complained that everything had changed. <laughs> <laughs> I think the good news is the church is not shying away from this responsibility. In this country we see the ongoing and heroic work of Catholic Charities, of the Catholic Legal Immigration Network Clinic, and other grassroots efforts aimed at accompanying the frankly terrified members of our immigrant communities as they weather the storm. One stellar, uh, example of stellar leadership is found in a brother bishop of mine, a, a conventual Franciscan named John Stowe, who is the bishop of the Diocese of Lexington, Kentucky. A diocese, I think, has about 3% of the population are Catholic. And he reflected in his own experience of the local church's response to immigration, writing in an article in America magazine, as a faith leader in Kentucky, I've been truly inspired by the grassroots efforts of people who have learned what it means to love your neighbor and how to exercise the mercy and compassion that Jesus demonstrates through his, throughout his earthly ministry. For example, says Bishop Stowe, in some of our rural communities, people of faith have been horrified to discover that neighbors could disappear overnight into detention or deportation. They stepped up to sign power of attorney papers for their neighbors and friends' children in case someone, someday those parents are taken away by the Immigration and Customs Enforcement. And finally, the bishop says, I've also been inspired by a pastor who makes it part of his daily routine to bring food and other necessities to an immigrant family whose main breadwinner has already been taken into custody. But Bishop Stowe notes the essential point. It is critical to humanize the, the issue of immigration, to introduce real people's experiences into the public consciousness if we want to bring about real and lasting changes in the treatment of immigrants and refugees in our country. So following his inspiration, I urge you not to look away with your eyes or with your hearts. As you contemplate stories like that of a 39-year-old, Marco Antonio Munoz, a man from Honduras, who a year ago, after being separated from his wife and three-year-old son at the border, hung himself in a Texas jail. I invite you not to look away from Manuel Antonio Cano Pacheco, a 19-year-old who's lived in the United States since he was three years old and who was kidnapped and killed only weeks after being deported to Mexico. I invite you to let your hearts be moved by the hundreds of parents who have been deported from the United States without their children and for the children themselves who find themselves immersed in this nightmare and will, and will carry deep psychological wounds for the rest of their lives. One very young girl whom the bishops own migration, our own migration and refugee services work to reunite with her family, couldn't recognize her mother. Now hearing these stories can tempt us to despair. Not so much to hardness of heart, but a numbness, a perilousness, a, a what can we do? Our indifferent response might in fact be a kind of coping me mechanism. Maybe we don't want to be this far gone as a people and feel helpless to move back towards solidarity. Maybe we've lost the ability to be moved or even shocked. Or maybe we want to be better, but despair as to how. Before we do that, let's recognize signs of the reawakening of the American heart. 
First, there's been a respectful resistance to many harsh immigration policies, including the travel ban. I strongly believe that the DACA program remains alive because 80 to 90 percent of the Americans public support these youth and want to give them permanence and a chance to become Americans. Harsh legislative proposals which would gut the family-based immigration system and a diversity visa program have been defeated in Congress. These are hopeful signs that the American public understands our heritage and our identity as a nation of immigrants. But I think the most significant sign of the reawakening of the American heart has come with the family separation issue at our southern borders. Parents, especially, understand the pain of the, a child forcibly removed from them. But you don't have to be a parent to understand the cruelty of the policy. That the policy was enacted to start with. The American public's response from all walks of life and all political stripes was heartening and a sign that the policy was not worthy of our nation. I am proud of the Catholic response to this issue particularly. The Episcopal Conference of the United States has provided basic need support to 900 families who have been separated with local communities providing food, clothing, and shelter in some instances all through the church funds or through contributions. You might recall that when the Archdiocese of Indianapolis decided to welcome several families from Syria. The state government denied any funds and we said that's fine. The archdiocese will support these these families. It was interesting the f donations came in spontaneously from other faith communities beginning with the largest synagogue in Indianapolis. And a few months after these families arrived and were settled reunited with relatives who are already living in Indianapolis. I spoke with one of the parents, both of the Muslims, and I asked, what was the biggest challenge they were facing? They said the biggest challenge was that their kids would wake them up on Sundays because they thought they would miss school after spending their whole lives in refugee camps. They were so delighted to be able to go to school. The American public has said an emphatic no to family separation. I would go farther and say no to a zero tolerance policy that prosecutes mothers and fathers for escaping violence and persecution with their children to seek safe haven in our country. I would say no to a policy just enacted that would charge refugees to have their applications heard. Instead of criminalizing these parents, we should be giving them due process in their asylum cases. They're not breaking the law by requesting protection from persecution. This is consistent with both domestic and international law. And in the end, the most humane situation to this crisis is addressing the root causes of violence and poverty in the Northern Triangle of Central America. I see the strong opposition to the family separation issue as a wake-up call to many Americans, especially Catholics, that our nation has certain values that must be upheld. Hopefully the spirit will grow so that we can come together as a country and enact comprehensive immigration reform, which creates an immigration system which is just, humane, and respectful of the rule of law. If this dark period can lead to a reawakening of the American public and passage of just immigration reform, it may well have been worth it. But we must not despair. Rather, we should act in a way that reflects the light of Jesus Christ into the world and continues to live out the mystery of his incarnation in it. Incarnation is always about goodness, choosing to descend into the misery and messiness of real human suffering. We continue to live out the incarnation by not failing to love. And that decision is transformative. I never say in conclusion, because someone once noted that a definition of second wind 
is what happens when a bishop says in conclusion. <laughs> Instead, I'd remind you that uh, I opened with the story of a church unwittingly absorbing the nastiness of its own cultural milieu. We can take to heart that that's a two-way street. Jesus knew that. Why? With our witness, we can become salt and light for the world. We can have an influence that permeates into people's minds and hearts and ultimately their actions. Faith can move mountains and the Holy Spirit blows where it will. So who knows? The world may find itself one formerly hardened heart at a time engaged in what Pope Francis has called a revolution of tenderness and wonder what on earth just happened. Thank you very much. Hey, I think there's some people with microphones ready. And if you have any questions or reflections or corrections, please. Your Eminence, it's yes. me, Janine Ripper, your favorite sacristan from New York that spends time in, in, in your churches. And another, a little off topic, but another marginalized group that they just grilled you on on the Today Show on April 17th was the unfortunate wording about homosexuals. I should let you tell people. So. You quoted Father James Martin, which I'm not a big, I'm not a big fan of his. But how how we're going to be able to change this? You know that, um, like you had said, that the the, the the language of the catechism is bad. The homosexuals. How are we going to prove this to the people? You know what I mean? Like you're not the head of the USSB. You know what I mean? How are we going to help make this better for them? Well, I, I mean, it's a very incendiary to topic in the United States. Actually, what I said was not that the language of the catechism was bad. I, I use it all the time. Yeah. But uh, on this particular issue, I think it's an unfortunate and easily misunderstood uh, use of the words intrinsically disordered. Because it's a philosophical uh, concept, but it doesn't say that in the catechism. And what people hear is a psychological concept that I am intrinsically disordered as a person. They either become very sad or they become very angry about that. I think the, uh, the beginnings of, of what Father Martin has called for, you know, is, is bridge building. Simply is to recognize people as people rather than a category. And then talk, I think the church you know, certainly can't agree with uh, the agendas in, in completely that people put forward, but we certainly can talk. It's interesting, uh, a brother bishop once noted, uh, I wish I was smart enough to have caught this, he said, what Francis is trying to encourage the church to do is follow the example of Jesus with three actions. Welcome, heal, call to conversion. But he pointed out it's not simply the three actions, it's also their order. And oftentimes we want people to convert, and then we may, we may heal you, and then afterwards we'll welcome you. <laughs> Follow that, those, those three things. And in the accompaniment, uh, some wonderful things can happen. did a great job describing the specifics of the sad and terrible situation of immigrants today. Um, as I expect most people know here, there's, there's resolutions pending that would address that, but they're being held up because of the question of what do we do about the borders and how many more people we should be admitting in future years. What are your specific thoughts on that? Because if we have the same open border policy that we did with past immigrants hundreds of years ago, most of those people lived in terrible situations that we would not wanted to have today. Yeah, I mean. So, so how many do we let in and how do we control our borders? I mean, it, it, it's, it seems that it, people object to the idea that we have a border control in exchange for taking the fear away from people being taken away who are already here. It seems kind of strange. Well, I think that the policy, if, if you look at the federal budget, the policy is not 
focused on the uh, on the borders as, 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 as much as that's in the news. If you look at the actual request for outlays, it's for beds in detention facilities in places like Newark. Now, I, I, I'll just give you my, my response and then maybe we won't debate it until we get a cup of coffee so other people can ask. I, um, I, I just want to hear your thoughts, that's all. Yeah, and, and I think that what you're calling for, and I think we would probably agree on this, there's a need for comprehensive immigration reform not simply tinkering and certainly not using it as, as an excuse to, to treat people badly. But let's talk about what, you know, wh what do we do with the fact that there are 11 million undocumented people in the United States? Do we somehow hunt them all down and then tell them to go back? And it's a 10 year wait if you want to apply uh, for for uh, a legal entry, or do we figure out some way of, in a humanely humane way, of dealing with this? So I'm not simply saying, and I don't think any bishop on either side of the border is calling for open borders. Nations have a right and a responsibility to regulate their borders. However, a, we also follow a savior who transcends borders and we have to always I think conjugate whatever policy we want to propose from the, from the per perspective of faith with a God who does not respect borders I think you just explained why it's so difficult to solve we can be specific on the 11 million but not what do we do about the rest yeah. who want to come yeah. And, and once again, what I said at the end of the talk, I think the ultimate solution is to try and address the needs uh, in that, the nor especially right now, the Northern Triangle, uh, those three countries, El Salvador, Guatemala, and Honduras. Instead of cutting off humanitarian aid to those countries, which was just done, I mean, I'm not the brightest bulb in the box, but I'm thinking, you know, if you want to not force people to look elsewhere, that's not the way to do it. Please. I came back recently from El Salvador and I worked in the prisons there. But there are so many examples that, such as the ones that you quoted, like one man went back for his father's funeral and he was killed at the graveside because he had left under threat of death, but he had been deported was by Mexico. Uh, the daughter of, uh, I mean the son of another was told at night if you're here in the morning, you know, you, you won't be the following morning. <clears throat> But uh, two things just I wanted to mention. First of all, even you did this, uh, it seems the media in general speak about us, I'm an immigrant obviously, but speak of those who live in the United States as Americans, as if that is our unique identity. But El Salvador, is also America, and Guatemala is, and Honduras is. So the first thing we need to do is change our vocabulary. So we should get used to using the term United States when we're talking about the 50 states. If we use America, remember we're talking about two continents. That's one thing. Uh, the second thing is that in El Salvador they've been doing excellent programs on prevention of violence and education of the youth to prevent their joining the gangs. Funded by US aid very often. The funds have now been cut off. Cut off with the accusation that they were not being used well, which is not true. So that we're cutting off our nose to spite our face. Thank you, sister. Hi, um, 
I'm an associate of the Sisters of Charity of New York and very involved with their immigration task force. A few months ago, actually last November, we sent out a letter to every parish in the Archdiocese pastor, personally addressed, asking them to preach on Epiphany Sunday about welcoming the stranger. We had, we followed every letter up with phone calls, rarely got to the pastor, but we feel out of the 274 letters, we had four commitments throughout the archdiocese. I find, I live in Orange County, and in the cities of Newburgh and Middletown, the homilies very much address the social justice issues, immigration, etc. But those are not the people that need to hear the message. In the rest of our parishes, mine and many others, I hear things like, Francis is a joke. I hear that the New York, from the pulpit, the New York Times is fake news. I ask for social justice issues to be addressed in homilies. They are not. Prayers of the faithful. We never, you know, I've been in my personal parish for seven years now. We have never pay, prayed for the victim of a terrorist act. Um, and it is not just my parish. It's the very middle class white parishes. And we are, we, we can read in Catholic New York, all that our Archbishop is doing. We can read about Catholic charities and they are doing wonderful work, but it doesn't. 250 newspapers come to my parish. 3,500 people go to mass on Sunday in my parish. Wonderful parish. But 250 get the message and probably half of them don't read it. And they're not getting the education locally. My need is for somehow for the hierarchy to get to the parishes and at that level begin to educate them and then to get some parishes to address the need, have groups meeting, etc. It just is not happening. Thank you. I'd like to follow up on that gentleman. I, uh, he echoed some of the things that I've been feeling. I think that as Cardinal and as the head of the Bishop's Conference, that no, not yet, well, okay. Uh, okay. <laughs> Well, you have enough influence, but I think that uh, reaching out to the training of the clergy to inculcate in our seminarians the ideals of compassion and empathy and understanding for neighbor, and neighbor is all mankind based on the old catechism that I remember. and. If we get that coming into the parishes and the young pastors and the older pastors preach to compassion and empathy, then we can have a change of heart, maybe in the Catholic congregation itself. And I would hope to see that done. Well, I'm wondering if you can tell us, um, I'm very conscious that we're so caught up in the real embarrassment, I think, in this country and the hardness of heart um, around immigration today. Um, I look at a future, uh, and many people on this planet do, of increased immigration, uh, not just because of terrorism and violence in local communities, but also because of climate change, and that's already beginning. Um, desperate people who can no longer live on their land and uh, islands disappearing. So when, if you could share with us um, the conversation uh, in, in Rome, um, some of the committees who may be working on this for the 
to anticipate really the the future crisis that we're looking at as well. There, there are a number of, of different groups in Rome that are, are working on, on, these, on these questions, but I'd like to maybe frame it with my favorite story about Pope Francis, if you don't mind. Yeah, can I tell my second favorite one first? <laughs> my second favorite one because it's kind of personal. He says, this was a couple of years ago, you know, on Wednesdays he has an audience if he's in town and they, they have it out on the St. Peter's Square. So before the audience he usually does a couple laps around the square in the in the Pope mobile and he says hi to people and kisses babies and things and he, I, this particular Wednesday a group of people were handing him a gourd with a metal straw in it and he recognized what it was it's a way the Argentinians like to have their tea called yerba mate and it's always a social event you know not if, not if we sit around the table and they pass it and so he took it, he took a couple slurps and gave it back and the, uh, the security went crazy. <laughs> and afterwards they said, you can't do that. It's a dangerous world. There's ISIS and there's Al Qaeda and there's all these threats. And he held up his hands and he said, those people, they were Argentinians. They weren't cardinals. <laughs> That's my second favorite story. My, my favorite story about Pope Francis, really this is, it was shortly after he was elected. He called up the then Secretary of State of the Holy See, uh, Cardinal Bertone, and he said, I want to go to Lampedusa. Lampedusa, you might know, is an island in the Mediterranean Sea. It's technically part of Italy, but it's much closer to North Africa, and it's a uh, a destination for people who are fleeing either from North Africa or the Middle East. And literally thousands of people have died in the waters around this because the, the ships are overloaded and they, they, if you come to my office in Newark you'll see a, a cross outside my, it's got a, looks like a couple pieces of like a two by two uh, with splashes of paint on it. But it was part of one of those boats and the people died, they all died. So the Secretary of State said, well, wait a minute, you know, you were just elected. This might not be the best time to travel. And this will be your first trip sort of outside Italy. And you may not be sending the message you want to send. So why don't you think about it for a little while? See, not even the Pope can just do that and get things done. So a couple of weeks later, he called Cardinal Bertoni and he said, um, I want to go to Lampedusa. And... But Tony said, well, you know, I guess he saw his mind was made up. So in the Holy See, if you don't like an idea, you still can delay it. You know, a guy I used to work with there said, uh, we live in the eternal city and everyone sets their watches. <laughs> and so he said, we can't plan these trips overnight. I mean, there's logistics and there's media and security. Maybe six months, or maybe a year. So maybe two more weeks passed and Cardinal Bertoni got a phone call, this time not from Francis. It was from a vice president of Alitalia, which is the national air carrier for Italy. And this vice president was a little nervous and he said, I thought you people would want to know that a passenger by the name of Jorge Bergoglio <laughs> has booked a, f a seat on the Rome Lampedusa flight. <laughs> now it's a charming story, but... <laughs> After I heard it a couple of times, I thought I was thinking about it. I said, well, why was he so fixed on getting there? Because as Archbishop of Buenos Aires, he wouldn't have met many refugees. They don't go to Argentina these days. There are immigrants that come from Paraguay, but uh, nothing like the challenges we're facing and other countries are facing. What changed his mind? He was now the Bishop of Rome with a response, a worldwide responsibility, and he did what the Council in many different ways asked us to do. Read the signs of times and places in the light of faith. See, see what's really happening around you and answer it because of your faith. 
And so he, in the face of 65 million refugees worldwide and an even larger number of migrants, in answer to your question, he said, we have to begin to make a response. So I think he set the, the tone. It was interesting when he went to the island of Lesbos, a couple of uh, part of Greece, a big recipient of refugees. He brought 12 back to Rome. He brought them and he, he actually touched them and he made sure they had housing. And he keeps, he invites them for meals to make sure they're doing okay. So he kind of personalizes it because with Jesus it's always personal because they have faces. I was glad I could get out of here with them before we tell you my two favorite Francis stories. And, <laughs> and I think, you know, he's nobody's fool. Again, he, he realizes the, the, the justice issues are not ideology. They're, they're complex. And they're, they're, but they're, if we want to do inhuman things to people, the first thing we have to do is take away their face. We have to not see them, or we have to not see them for who they really are. And you know, I've got eight sisters. Uh, you, my, part of my preparation for community life was living in a house with eight sisters in one bathroom. <laughs> you, you learn not to be selfish. But one of them, who's now, if I can brag, a federal judge, uh, she, uh, she loved history. She was her undergrad. And uh, I used to steal her books when I was on vacation and read things. And she had a, a book that, that looked at the Allied bombing policy in World War II. And he said when the United States entered the war, they had a very strict policy that they were only going to bomb military targets. That changed. Uh, by 19, early 19, uh, late 1943, early 1944. But this was the insight of the article. At the same time, the propaganda had to change so that the Japanese and the Germans had their humanity stripped away from them. That they were Japs and they were Krauts and they were all these other things. And it got to a point where after the firebombing of uh, Tokyo, in which more people died than in Nagasaki and Hiroshima combined, General Curtis LeMay, who was the, the commander of the, the raid, was able to say, we demonstrated convincingly that the Japs, when properly kindled, burn nicely. Oh. Now, he couldn't have said that off the cuff. That had to be a product of an ongoing dehumanization of the enemy. That's why my dad, who was a World War II, he lost his leg in World War II. But he would always say to me, in war, nobody has clean hands. Because it dehumanizes us. And we, begin, we return the favor by dehumanizing each other. So I think one of the great things we can do is until we've solved the, 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 the challenge of comprehensive immigration reform, we can at least keep people's faces in front of us. You know, that's what happened with the separation issue, and I think that's what happens, can happen when we look at people and recognize them for who they are. Well, I, you've been a wonderful group tonight. Um, I forgive you for the slander that New Yorkers heap on people in the Garden State. Um, especially that horrendous remark that the reason why New Yorkers say they're frequently depressed is because they realize the end of the tunnel, at the light at the end of the tunnel is New Jersey. But I'm glad to be there and I was really glad to be with you tonight. God bless you.